And so welcome everyone to Taxonomy Tuesday. This is our, our weekly show and tell of everything that we have found for the week. Um, basically, we just take turns sharing our screens and showing off our mushrooms and either giving an ID for other people to learn from or requesting an ID. And we'll do our best to help you identify the mushroom you have. Um, if you have a hard time sharing the screen, you can definitely email me. Um, I received an email, I think, from Susan Hopkins and from Dave. So I do have both of your, your two emails. Um, and we always get a queue going. So if people want to start typing into the uh, chat your name, and we'll just go in that order of whoever puts your names in there. Um, so please put your names in there, though. Um, don't wait until three quarters of the way through to do it because I, I kind of judge it, you know, if only five people put it in, I just let people go on and on. And then at the end, a couple of people want to go at the last second. And then I feel like I'm rushing people and I hate doing that. I'm not trying to like rush anybody. I'm just trying to make sure everybody gets their turn. So with that being said, um, we have 21 people in here tonight. So just please uh, try to be conscientious of that and keep your sharing to, you know, five mushrooms or 10 minutes or so, something in that ballpark so that we all get a turn. All right. All that being said, looks like we have some people lined up. So who's first in here? Hervé, looks like you were the first one in. So are you ready to go, Hervé? You're muted, Hervé. I see you holding your finger up, but I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I'm not ready yet. Okay, we'll, we'll skip ahead then. We'll come back around to you. Um, how about Matt? Yes, hi. Hey, um, I, I just joined this week, so I'm very new to this. Um, and let me pull up my screen if I could. Uh, not see it here. All right, I'm, I'm going to have to um, just move on and pull up my file um, and then share it. Mm -hmm. do, you need, do you need a few minutes or? Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just need a minute. Okay. And we'll see if Lila's ready. And we'll come back around. <laughs> sure. Let's give it a shot here. Okay, let's start with this, uh, this one. I think it's Pinafora albobadia. Uh, Maricel should like this, it's a crust, I believe. And let's take a look at it. It is, yeah. Okay, so very attractive. Um, I don't think I've really, I've seen something that looks similar to it, but I really hadn't noticed it before. Uh, I think I, I got all three of these were about 10, 12 days ago I found them. So, um, a bit closer in. Um, yeah, some sort of a, a hardwood log. Mm -hmm. Here I did. But that was um, it was interesting. There was nothing uh, else about it, just this uh, crust covering over uh, a part of the log. Some of it big patches, some of it little. So it was it was just interesting. Caught my eye. People call those giraffe spots. <laughs> yeah, I see that in the common name. So it, you can kind of can kind of see that with your imagination. That was a, 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 a Vicky from our club uh, naming. We see that all winter when we go out every week in the winter. Okay, I'll just uh, now that I know it, I'm learning it, maybe I'll see more of it. <laughs> These things uh, that catch your eye. All right. So next up. Um, yeah, the, the warm weather that we had at the beginning of November, I think, brought these out. Uh, I wasn't expecting to see this Copernalis micaceus. I think, also think this is a correct ID. 
um, popped out from a, an ash log that was kind of making like a raised bed. And um, they were pretty to look at. You can see it doesn't it doesn't look like the gills are attached. But you can see the um, these little mica um, flakes or granules that are on the cap and the heavily um, striated cap. Um, stem was white. It was hollow, broken and open. Um, I think the guidebook, I was looking at um, Baroni's book and at um, uh, Gary Linkoff's Audubon book, and I thought it said that the flesh should be white, but maybe these are getting older and the flesh was is, seems to be more brown than, than white, but everything else seemed to check out uh, on this. Is it, it might be possible, I think I've, my understanding is that this is a complex of species now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you, there may be a one that has white flesh. Yeah. You, I think uh, you might get information from spore shape. Yeah. Uh, regarding the um, different taxa that are grouped under the heading of Copernellus mycetia. Okay. Um, so I think there's one kind that's supposed to have like spores that are strongly mitroid, I think is the word, looking like a bishop's hat. Right. Yeah, and there's other ones that are a little bit more just elliptic, uh, ellipsoid, but truncate. So it's really, honestly, the difference between those two shapes is pretty subtle. Okay. I'm not sure anybody really knows how to tell from any kind of morphology. So what part is supposed to be glossy? Glossy? Okay, yes. Do you say something is, is called mica? Uh, that, would be, that would be the flex. Yeah, see where her cursor is? The flex on the cap. Yeah, the, the, the um, mineral mica, or it might be a more than one mineral. I'm not sure it's a rock. But um, it has little shiny flecks in it. And um, so the shiny flecks on the cap of this species, of this type mushroom, mimic the tiny flecks that are in a rock that's called okay, mica. Okay, I see. I see. And it looks like the the uh, the tips of the gills are starting to to um, gilliquest. Gilliquest. Yeah, the this Copernellus is is lumped in with the inky caps. It doesn't necessarily deliquesce very quickly, and sometimes it dries up before it deliquesces. Okay. Now, Copernopsis and Coprinus mushrooms, they, they, they will, and, and Parasola also, I believe most of those will, um, will turn to, to liquid. But oftentimes, Copernellus will dry out before it deliquesces, so it, it does so very slowly when it does. Dave? Yes? What I understand is that this group is divided in four, Coprinus, Coprinellus, Parasola, and I forgot the other one. And not all of them deliquesce. I, yeah, Coprinellus is the one that, that deliquesces the, the, the most slowly. So let me see, Coprinus, Coprinellus, Coprinopsis, and pa Parasola. Right, yeah. those are the four. Yeah, mm -hmm. not all of them become a liquid. Yeah, I think that some of the Parasola uh, species might not deliquesce. They don't well. have Coprinopsis. Lagopus doesn't do it either. The Coprinopsis, Coprinopsis don't do it. Uh, I think it does, doesn't it? No, I, think I, I know that does. one. I know does that it? one. Yeah, I know that one. Oh, okay. Okay. The, the last one I had is, uh, is I think, some sort of a, a flebia. Flebia uh, radiata. Radicata, I think it radiata. is, or radiata. radiata. Mm -hmm. I have okay. tried it. Yeah, okay. I know radiata. Oh, yeah, I put too many Ds. It's only one D, sorry. Okay. You get these little like fruit bodies that pop up out of it, I guess. I, I was looking at some photos of that and I didn't 
I must not have looked at very many because I don't think I saw these little fruit bodies. Yeah, you I don't remember that? seeing those um, when I found this, which is not very often. Um, Most I, of I, it doesn't have it, as you see here on this log. This was a, an old, uh, um, well, a uh, tulip poplar, large. Huh. Maybe you got something extra. Yeah, that might be like a jelly no, that's um, no, fruiting no. on it. No, that's the way um, it belongs to Flavia radiata, and it also, uh, Flavia radiata can present itself with different colors. Not only this nice orange tone, but almost like grayish, yellowish, purplish, and it's still Flavia radiata, and it presents these um, projections. Not in all the, not in all of the, how you say, the different fruiting bodies. But it is part of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, not a very good focus picture, but a real, that's probably 10x. So, so what is the function of the central part? Relative to, uh, to the uh, flat part. I, I don't know what you're saying, Herve. I think he wants to know these uh, fruit bodies that are protruding from the, the basic um, context of this. What, what do they have some special role or a different okay. role? So that where are the spores, know. for instance? The spores are spread on the hymenium. The hymenium uh, is using the wrinkled aspect and the protruding shapes to have more surface to produce more spores. That's why fungi have teeth or wrinkles or gills or pores to increase the surface uh, to produce spores. Is, is Flebia an asco or a basidiomycete? I it's a basidia and it's a crust. Okay, so you know what would be interesting to get one of these things that looks like a little mush, orange mushroom on a stalk that's sticking out of the hymenium and scope it and see if you can find basidia or anything on, on it. You know, I mean, I, is that part of the hymenium? Because that th that, that's a good question that was posed. What is the function of that mushroom looking thing that's sticking off of it? You know, now that you're saying that, I really, I have found Flavia many times in the park where I go, and uh -huh. I have seen it the protruding shape, but this one is a little weird. I yeah, it certainly is. Say about yeah. It. yeah, the three of them. But if you look on the lower right, at the left of that big orange cap thing, there is one of the regular protruding shapes sticking up. To the lower left. Okay, first you gotta look on the lower right. You oh, over the on the right side. So, oh, there's, oh, I see. There's a little, like, a tiny stalk-like yes, yes. thing. Uh -huh. I see it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so that's normal? You usually that's see those? Normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these other other things are probably yeah, just exaggerated ones of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You're right. I didn't see it carefully. Hmm. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. All right. All right, so rad radiata, radiata? Sí, radiata. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, I will update my observation. Thank you. Why is it called Flebra radiata? Uh, Flavia means vein, right? I don't know. And radiata means radiating. Yeah, it radiates from a I central can't see point. the radiation. I understand yeah. the radiating part of it. Yeah, it radiates from a central sort of yes. uh, point. How about the Flavia? No clue, I have no idea. Yeah. Because there are several species and there are some that are called flebiopsis, like flevia, but flevia meaning no idea. Well, isn't it like flebioid? I always think of flebioid like merulioid, that wrinkle, isn't that the, the term for that, that look, that shape? I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't I, know. Yeah, I think I have heard the word flebioid being used before for things that look like that. Oh. So. All right, cool. Thanks, Lila. So I'll just mention to anybody that's um, just joined us, if you have anything you want to share, um, type your name into the uh, chat so I get you into the queue. And um, Matt, were you ready yet? 
your music. I'll give it a try. Let, <laughs> let's let's see what comes up. Um, oh, okay. So, um, like I say, this is my my first time doing this. Um, I know nothing about wild mushrooms or in the wild. So, uh, when I'm out walking around, I'll take a picture and. Um, I just have a, a whole stock of them. Uh, and this is uh, one that I saw last week, just walking through the woods uh, in a nearby park. I'm in a town called Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Um, and, and this is in a little park nearby. I grew up in Bernardsville. Ah, okay. So this is something called Terry Dunham Park. It's a little wooded section. What was uh, it again? Uh, Harry Dunham Park. Oh, okay. Yeah. We don't see the photos bigger. Oh. Uh, you want to see them bigger? But of course. Yeah, <laughs> one, one at a time. Taking we're just as, seeing, as much yeah, we're just seeing possible. your thumbnails right now. Do you, do you see them? Oh, you don't see them? No, only the well, I see five of them, but we need to oh, see you don't see the time. Oh, you don't see the individual. Okay. Um, all right. Let's, okay. Let me try something. Um, is that any better? No? Yeah, Good. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Biotopsis nidulans. I wrote the name in the chat. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you eat these or do you not eat these? No, they don't no. eat them. No. Okay. And they say that it smells like cabbage. Oh, it could. So it sometimes. says that the smell, yeah, sometimes. sometimes. The smell will, um, will oh gosh, uh, will avoid you from eating it. Yeah, it smells like cabbage, but not in a nice way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My yeah. ex-husband used to call it coal gas. Yeah. Yeah, so sometimes it has the coal smell? gas smell. Sometimes it doesn't smell. No, the yeah. one oh. people that don't smell. Yeah, people are posting a lot of those, and, and I am telling them about the cabbage smell, and they said that it didn't smell like that, but. Okay. Yep. All right. And, you know, it's Let funny, because, yeah, people always say it smells, and every time I ever smell it, like, I just, I just saw some this weekend, and I never get a bad smell from it. Oh. I have, but not always. Okay. You, you have to, you have to warm it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, that's a good me, that's a good point <clears throat> does that one come up not yet not do yet. you have the picture of the other side uh yes i do Forty seven seventy nine looks like the underside um if i could i'm i'm not quite sure why these are not showing up as can you see that one no nope. no only as a thumbnail. All right, let's see if I can get back to it. How about that? Yeah, good. Perfecto. Okay. So that's the underside. Very nice. It's very photogenic, that mushroom. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can pull up something else. And they hang around for a long time. And another thing is that it doesn't have a stem. It's attached laterally to the wood. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, does that one show up? Yep. Okay. So these were just, I was raking leaves last week and um, this is a, in a compost pile in my backyard. Um, and these just popped up and I wasn't quite sure what they were. Nina. <laughs> Related to bluets, but um it was growing on leafy um yeah. decomposed. Uh, they look leaf. like over the hill bluets to me. Lapista nuda. But actually they look like fairly fresh ones, but they're just faded or or maybe they're just ones that are very lightly colored. Can we you see the undersides? You have an underside? Yeah, let me see. Let me see if I can do that. Mm 
One sec. Oh, there it is. Can you see the underside now? Oh. Not, not only, yeah. only in the thumbnail. But it oh, looks not, like that. It's not enlarged yet. Yay. Yeah. Oh, that looks a lot better. That yeah. looks like a nice one to me. It does. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking of the ones that have, I've seen in my yard recently. They, by the time they have that dark color, they they've all turned brown. Uh, well, it's possible. I I I just discovered it, <clears throat> and um, you know there were some real small ones there as well. Yeah. Okay. Just, just realize that there is a Cortinarius that is poisonous that can look a lot like this if you were thinking of eating it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't eat anything until I really know what it is. So. Right, that's a good yeah. idea. Okay. Take right, a now. spore print and you'll learn a little bit more about this species. And how do you do that? Well, um, some people say take a, lay it down with the deals down on aluminum foil. Uh -huh. Some people say use paper, but if you use paper, the problem is paper tends to absorb uh, leach moisture out of the mushroom, mushroom and oh, once, the, once it gets wet, it alters the way the, the print looks. Or if you have a flat piece of glass, a microscope slide, or some other flat piece of clear glass, you can take a print right on the glass and then move the glass mm -hmm. over a perfectly white or perfectly black surface of any type, and you'll get a pretty good idea of the color of the spore print. But you usually need you usually need to allow the print to develop for you know maybe maybe 15 20 or even more uh, number of hours uh, oh, okay. so you get a good thick print so you can get a, a good read on the color and you can also cut the stem so you can lay the cap flat on the surface that you're going to okay great yeah cut the step cut the stem flush with the the the, the edges of the gills so so that you're resting the gills down on the surface where you're collecting the spores. Okay. And the, the, the spore print on this is going to look pinkish. Okay. Yeah, and it needs to be good and thick though, or else it'll look white. Um, yeah. It's yeah, it's gotta be it's gotta be a good thick print or else it'll look white because it's really very pale. Right. But but the, the poisonous look-alike will have a brown spore, spore print. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, I think I have one last one, um, and it may have been similar to what, um, let's see. Does that one pop up? Nope. No, okay. Um, that? Yep. Okay, so I think that may be similar to what the other one was. Yep. Um, okay. Same thing that Lila had, or, or very, very, close relative okay great all right well good thank you very much thank you awesome thanks matt yeah okay Hervé, were you ready yet ready all right just screen okay let's see this one I click on the wrong. It's on iNaturalist. My my ID is HB2000. If you you know you welcome to go there if you like to help me identify my mushrooms. Okay, just one second. Oh, yeah, okay. Can you see it? No. Not yet, everybody. You cannot see it? Mm -mm. That's bizarre. <laughs> is, it, is it the case that you need to um, stop, unshare, and then share again with that thing on your 
that's it already on your screen? No? There you go, everybody. Start a okay. E. <laughs> there you go. Oh, wow. Huh. So I found this on a log, on a large log. Do you have an ID for it? I think it's a fan shape, fan shaped jelly fungus. Yeah, I think I think this the genus is a Dacronopax or Dacronopax. Yes. Or, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dacronopax patularia. Patularia. Yeah. Yep. You're right. Okay, I have oh, two And that was conifer wood, you said? Sorry? Was that a conifer? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I could go back and figure out what it is, but I'm not, I don't know. Maybe it's a conifer. Okay, next one. For this one, my question is, is the blue margin uh, significant? What happens is that when it's fresh, it's more purplish and it fades. Okay. But it's still showing that purple edge. It's growing. Yeah. If you see the purple edge, that's a pretty good sign it's tricaptum. But mm -hmm. sometimes, as Maricel is suggesting, you, it can still be tricaptum, but you might not see much purple. Yep. Right. It was kind of neat, you know, to see this blue, uh, this blue ring, this blue margin. It's mostly purple. Uh, yeah. Is there a, uh, there's another form besides biformi, right? The abierta something or other? It's yeah. abietum. Abietinum and another one. Abietinum, okay. Abietinum for conifer. For conifer, yeah. Yeah. Which is what I have mostly up here. Ah, uh, now do they have the Phaeocalycium uh, polypareum on them? Is what I'm always excited to look on every one to see if I can find. It. Oh, the the asco that attacks it, that parasitizes it. The little tiny matchstick that often oh, yeah. is on there. Mm -hmm. I, I've never seen that on any of them, but the biforme myself. I think I um. Yeah, I think I've I think I asked um um oh man um I asked somebody about that one time and he told me that um I'm trying to think of what his name is, the guy that wrote Stoned Reindeer, the guy from Boston, um the um Larry Millen Lawrence Millman. Yeah, Larry Millman, that right. I think he told me that you know you would rarely ever find it on um the Abiatum. He said that would be really rare, whether he knew or not, you know. That's what he told me. So what species do you think it is? Before me, looks like. What kind of wood is it? Oh, I don't it looks remember. like it looks like a um, birch or yeah. oh yeah, it looks like birch. It does look like a, a wood a, a deciduous wood, which would mean it would be a tricaptum biformi, probably. But I read that not, it's not as strictly like that. So both species, Abietinum and, and Tricaptum before me, could be found on the opposite type of wood. Is there some other criteria then? Yeah, the way, the aspect of the pores. You have to pay attention to that. I think that what is, one is more labyrinthic and the other one is more like tooth. 
Oh, okay. When yeah. they're young, though, wouldn't they both be, you know, before they develop the this these elongated walls and that turn into teeth, would they be harder to tell? I wouldn't be able to say that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. The um, phaeocolysium that you see on some of them, those are uh, colysioid lichens. And they're generally specific to certain um, brackets. Um, and I don't, I can't remember which one, which ones are which right now. I was wondering whether you could uh, zoom in on that one of those. Um, oh, okay, you're moving on. Okay, do you want to see the picture again? Well, I, I was just going to suggest that if you could enlarge the picture of the top of the cap, maybe we could see the polyporation. Okay. Right? Maybe not. They're not always on there. Yeah, not necessarily. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, I'm not. I don't think. I mean, there's not much chance we'll be able to see it, but there is some. Yeah, I asked um, James Lendemere, the lichen guy up in up in New York, about that about these um, in terms of lichen lichenization, and he told me that it's thought that they were once lichenized, and they gave up their lichen partners in lieu of eating um, fungus. Like they right. gave up their algae and just became a fungus eater. Oh, roll one. Oh, wow. Roll one. You need to do a lecture on that, Luke. What's that? Have uh, James Lundemere do a lecture on that? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a fascinating talker, speaker. All right, what else you got there, Hervé? Okay, this, how about this one here? This one is interesting because it looks like there is snow on top of the mushrooms. That's not snow at all. It is uh, Flevia tremelosa. I think you, you show it in another photo. Can you tell me the name again? Flevia tremelosa. I can Flevia. write it in the chat, but can we see the photo to make sure it's that? Okay, be patient. We. Oui. <laughs> Allez, soyez patient. Oh, well. Yep. Flavia. Yeah, I agree. I just found some the other day, which is like it. Flavia tremelosa. The cap is really white and hairy, and the underneath is like flesh color and merulioid. It's considered a crust. Yeah, but it's but it's rubbery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, when I saw it, I thought that it was the other side. I thought that the log had been, you know, overturned <laughs> and that we were seeing the other side. Yeah, yeah. You usually don't see this till it's kind of cool or almost cold late fall or fall. You see, yeah. Uh, mm hmm. Where is that? Okay, that's it. Next person. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. You wanna uh, hit the stop share button? All right. So Marisol, are you ready to go? Si. I have an order here after Marisol. I have um, Sue, then Dave, and then uh, Timur. 
So if there's anybody else that wants to uh, get in there. Yeah, give me one second that I was not ready for the iNaturalist. I need one minute. Okay. Oh, geez. How do you, do want, that? you want me to do, want me to do Susan's? You please go. I wasn't ready. I didn't realize. Go ahead. Okay. Are you ready, Susan? Yeah, sorry. I'm unmuted now. Okay. Just have to get to it. Oh, you always have bunches of emails. Right. Aren't peel fungus? Nice. Yeah, I thought folks, uh, somebody had this up, I think, a week or two ago, and I saw this uh, first time this fall after many years not seeing it, and I it just happened to get a really good shot of it. They're about three inches across the little cluster on the right. I didn't pick it up to see if it would poof its spores out. But it's a beautiful fungus. Oh, you don't have to pick it up. If you blow and wait, they will do it. Yeah, I, I do that a lot up okay. here. I do mushroom walks. As if I have a cup fungus, I, if I pick it up, it, it, it sometimes will poof on its own. Or, or if you blow across it, it will poof the spores out for you. That always impresses people. Are you ready for me to move on? Sometimes it comes out in spring also. Does it? I've seen it in spring, rarely. Yeah, I actually was surprised to see it, to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah uh, late is when I, other times when, I'm, when I see it. Yeah, it was kind of a funny wet spot that was very shaded. I would have said uh, late September, maybe. Can you describe a little bit the habitat? Like near a road or lake? Or On the ground, leaf mulchy. I would say it's a saprophyte. Uh, in this case, it was a mixed uh, uh, conifers as well as um, probably a lot of maple. Okay, okay. Some um, aspen, poplar. Mm, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is for Dorothy, even though she may not be on. Graphis scripta, it's a lichen. I'd never even heard of it until Dorothy pointed it out to me one time when she was up here. But it's a Graphis scripta? Something like that. Is it right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's actually up in the corner of the picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. It's still, I'd never seen anything like this until a few years ago. But this, this year and last year, I've seen it just about everywhere. And it's usually always on beach. See, si, me too, me too. Uh huh. I have seen it on beach. I don't know. Do you see this down in New Jersey much? Yeah, not a lot, but I have seen it in beach like once or twice. In huge ones, huge beach. Yeah, this is about six or eight inches across and about five inches top to bottom. I just think it's an interesting thing that most people wouldn't even notice. Mm -hmm. I meant to say on huge beach trees. Uh, where I go is uh, mature. Uh, beach trees. No, it's been on just about every size of beach. I mm -hmm. where I am. So what it, occur, it occurs on a lot of other kinds of trees, also besides. The, I've seen it a lot in Maine, mm. but that's a nice big, huge patch of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. that is nice. So what we're looking at here for anybody who can't quite make it out, this is a crustose lichen, which means it's embedded into the bark of this tree. So all this white. All the way around here, that, that entire thing is the lichen. But the black things on here, which I guess where the name scripta comes from, because it looks like some kind of like writing, that's where the actual fruiting bodies are. So this, the, I guess the ASCO part of it will be in there. Yeah, thank you for describing that, Luke. I, I, I didn't think of that, but yeah. That's a cool one. Yeah, it is. That's why I thought. Yeah. Yeah, the spore, it's neat to look at the spores too. I think if I remember they're long and um, divided. So you'd scrape a bit off and put it on a slide and squash it with yes. your water? Yeah, in water. Okay, I should try that next year. One thing about the crustos, lichen, it has a margin. You see that around it is a, a space with no, not too many of these. Mm, right pretended letters and so the fertile part is the one with the 
the black little line. Old fashioned, yeah, like very yeah. ancient type of writing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. I hear that voice again. Okay, Luke. So. Oops. Oh yes. Yeah. Another view of Phyllotopsis nigilans. I found it in a couple of places this year, and it's just such a beautiful thing. Very photogenic. Um, so I remember it's kind of a pinkish spore print. I left it out in wax paper out in my vestibule and it just dropped a very thick spore print, but it's usually recognizable by the bright orange color and the very fuzzy, fuzzy surface on top. Isn't really any stem and often in multiple layers. Oh my God. Deciduous wood. Okay, that was also something this fall. Oh, and this this is something I think somebody had a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I don't see this that often. You might want to zoom in on that, especially up toward the top. This is yeah. Lycatoropsis crispa with the, the little tiny fronds. They're only about a half inch across, and then the underside is a very funny little maze white, not very thick. Um, and that brown going to a white kind of fat margin is fairly typical, which is what drew, drew my eye to it, to turn it over to see if it was what I thought it was. I think it's a really cool little mushroom. And it's soft. You touch it and it's different to the, like the feeling of a stereo in the species? Yeah, well, it's kind of a, a it's soft, flexible like a polypore thing, yeah. But each one of those little fronds is only about a half an inch across or so. A little, maybe a little more, three quarters of an inch. But that's kind of neat to see a whole lot of them like that on a log. And it looks like it it's, looks again like it's either beech or maple. I forget now. Very neat. Yeah, isn't that neat? Yeah. All right. I think that was all of them. Yep, that's all four. Cool. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Marisol? Yeah, finally. All right. Okay. Mm. Is this all stuff you've seen this week? Uh huh. This weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I miss New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next to my house, actually. I'll show you this one only because we talk about this one with Herve. When I saw it, I, I thought it was. Um, uh, Trametes Irsuta because it looks very hairy and when I turned it over I was like what? It was the captain before me. I couldn't believe it. Um, so and then this one is also the same. The fresh um, ones are in the right. This one is always soaking wet and it's a little light gelatinous but it's still the purple color yeah sometimes the captain before me i do not know if that's why they call it before me it takes only at a resupinate aspect which means like a whitish crust no caps and it um, and then few few caps are like in the edges it's like extending i, I don't know exactly why it does that Oh, actually, you have a little white part right here, and it will grow like a big cross of the white only. This one is on cherry. I think this is a very underrated mushroom. You know that? Yeah. Because it's so common, everyone kind of passes over it, but when you actually really look at it, I mean, it's really beautiful. It's beautiful, yep. Yeah, I found some that looks just like this, and I put it on my queue, and honestly, I didn't know what it was because mm -hmm. it's different than what it usually looks like. Yep. It does, the, the pores are not elongated in, into, um, uh, the walls are not elongated into teeth. They're, they're more um, maze-like, but I guess it's maybe just younger. Yeah, I think it's younger. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got one too. And, and I, I posted it on Mushroom Observer and just mm -hmm. called it 
polyporolies because it didn't look familiar to me. It didn't look like what I'm used to seeing with tricaptin. So we'll, we'll see that again maybe in a few minutes. I found something really neat. Um, nobody has posted yet on, on iNaturalist. And I didn't find the name by myself. I post the photos, posted the photos on Facebook and people from Europe, they helped me. Ana Rosa Bernicchia, she's an expert from Italy. She told me it's called Stecherinum Robustius. Like robust, Robustius. Mm, and it was so incredible. Orange teeth with a white margin. Oh, the photo's not too clear, but you can see a little bit right there. And there was a huge fruiting body on the deciduous. And let me see if I have, a, yeah. This one was a little hidden, so it was harder to take a photo. Oh, you can see that the tips of the, the tips of the teeth are whitish. Oh, I can, you can see right there. That's a really good photo. <laughs> Thank you. And I did the micro and it has, the structures that are characteristic of Stecherinum, like Stecherinum ocraseon and Stecherinum um, bordotti. Uh, it has a, a structure that is called encrusted cystidia, but I don't have a photo. I couldn't get a good micro photo, so I couldn't do it. But I was like corroborating that it was Stecherinum robustius. Robustius. So Kate asked about the uh, the actual shape of the spines, pointed or flattish? They look kind of flattish to me. Some of them look like flat, but some of them are pointy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So the name is like there is Techerinum robustius, robustius, I would say. All right. That's a cool find. It's a cool I've never, one. I've never heard of that one. Yep. I knew it in the in the box, but never, never even even dream of finding that thing. And I have a surprise for you. Now the the one person showed the um, what I thought it was plicaturosis crispa when I saw it, uh -huh. and when I turned it over, it wasn't plicaturosis crispa. So I posted the photos in Facebook. It was there were so many of them troops very close to the Stecherinum robustius. <laughs> And when I turned it over, surprise, huh? no white wrinkles. I was like, what on the earth is that? So I posted in Facebook and people gave me a big surprise. And I went to the box and I confirmed that it was what they are telling me. And I'm going to tell you what it is. Cylindro basidione volpens has spores that have a tear shape, as you can see right there. And um, what happened is that it's a, sometimes it, it's a crust, but sometimes it grows as sem, in a semi pileate form. What's the right way of saying that word? Pileate, pileate word form, like a little cap. You mean like a little semicircle? Yes, yes. So I went to the books and it, it is. It says in, the, in this uh, book from Switzerland that sometimes you find it growing as a semi pileate cap. So that was a cool find too, because I found it, I think, once, but as a crust, not like this. Wait, what is that? Now, there were so many of them. In pileated. Our... Pileated, like the woodpecker. Oh, that's the word that is in the book P I L Pileated? T E. Pilate, Pilate. Okay. Could you tell what kind of wood it was? And it's deciduous, but I couldn't tell what it was. No, no conifers in that area. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I also, this is close to my house. There is like a little spot with old trees in there and people throw all sort of debris from plants. That's where I found all these things. And I found, what is the other one? All of them, oh yes, in the same spot. But I think that got, I got the wrong name. 
I don't see the reticulations. I see estriations. So I have to make clear that is what I am saying, but I, I think that I am wrong. Uh, this one looks like the one I found before in, in, in Smithville. This one is next to my house in Lumberton. It was so beautiful. It was so mu It was covered with a layer of mucus. You can see there. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah. yeah Just re one. Reticulitis does, is not always reticulate. Sometimes oh. it's striate. You oh. can tell from the spore size if you're certain it's bulbidious. Oh. Reticulitis has smaller spores. Okay, I'll check. And then, uh, what is it? T Titubans, I guess is what they're calling it. Now okay, the okay. So it was found on the ground, but there were so many pieces of wood buried there because there was a giant tree um, that is falling apart. So it was growing on little pieces of wood. The, the stem, my photo's not that great, but in the stem, you can see that it's full of this hiva, I don't know the right name for, for the gill mushrooms. I think those are callocystidia. Oh, okay, callocystidia, okay. okay. And the gills are kind of attached, adnated, attached maybe. Okay, and um, let me see what other photos I have. Oh, that's much better for them, for the gills. Uh, oh, look at what it forms uh, on the stem. It's like something continues down for a little bit. Is there a name for that, Dave? Sometimes they, they refer to that as a decurrent tooth. Oh. But those are really pretty long and, 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 and interrupted. Oh, so yeah. I think they would just say, I think you would just say that the apex is striate. Oh, okay. But that's, but you know, it's one person says one thing and another. <laughs> says another okay. Thing. Okay. Did you get a spore print color from this? I did. Yep. Ah. And I did the sports too. I don't know if I put, posted the photo yet. Oh gosh. Because sometimes I, I get, no, I didn't post it. I don't remember. I don't remember, but I did everything. And I dry it out and I put it on, on a leaf and it got attached to the leaf and I could not get it off. So it's dried on a leaf because it got really glued on there. Do I have time for one more? Sure. What was the color? Of the, the sports? Like, I don't remember. I can't remember because I did so many mushrooms. I don't it remember. should be like cinnamon, like, like reddish brown kind of bulbidious usually is. Bulbidious would be somewhat cinnamon brown, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Not, no, no, I got too much information. I'm not, my brain can't, can't do it. It's too much. Mm. Do I have time for one more? Sure, I think we have plenty of time. There's only oh, three more. There's only three of us to have anything ah, okay. left. Okay. Unless anybody else has anything, speak up. Okay. Uh, oh, and when I was coming back home, um, I found this <laughs> on the street. Uh, there is um, a street near my house with a lot of um, giant oak trees, and they are looking now kind of sickish and uh, and then this Ganoderma cecile is grow it takes turns to grow in one and then it disappears and then grows on the other one and I keep taking photos and because I use that street a lot so this is Ganoderma cecile this mm, shiny aspect of cap with orange tones and yellowish and the white edge is characteristic of cecile it's growing at the base of the oak. Here are the pores. What's like a little monster? Here you see the lacquer aspect. And it's like a fat edge, roundish. Little tiny ones, like maybe less than an inch, babies, starting to grow at the base, all in the same tree. That's the where it's growing right here, right here. And some babies, the babies are right here. And um, this is how the tree is looking. Some branches are kind of sick and it's huge. And also, I also found this 
coming home that day from getting all these beautiful mushrooms. Mm, right here, where is it? Where is it? Oh, yes. It was at the base of another giant oak, but like a few blocks away from the first one. And the port surface was white. It was a little, a little old, but it was a surprise. That's how I saw it when I was driving and my eye caught, um, something caught, caught my attention. And I said, aha. Uh, Marcel, according to oh. John Plischke, mm -hmm. the white poured laets porous mm -hmm. that grows in shelves directly on wood is an undescribed species, <gasps> documented species. Ooh. And that Cincinnatus always grows in rosettes on, on the, the basis oh. of the Oh, okay. Yeah, and sometimes a few feet from the tree on, on the roots. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. This, this looks like a candidate. You know, or it could that? be Cincinnatus growing in a, you know, atypical um, mm -hmm. uh, form, mm -hmm. but it could be this other thing that, you know, According uh -huh. to what John told me, there's an undocumented okay. late chorus that fits this description. I found this too. I have found this too very rarely, right on oak trees. Okay. Right on the tree. Sometimes pretty high up too on the tree. Oh, and when I last one, when I was um, taking a little piece to to observe it, there was a huge, uh, an older fruiting body of the Cincinnatus thing. And when I turn it over, it has this beautiful, I thought it was a crust, but it wasn't. It's hypomyces. I still don't know which species. I did the micro, but I don't know exactly which one yet. So you can mm -hmm. see the pore surface of this like Tiporus, and you can see how beautiful that thing is. It has a did, you, did you find some ascii when, when you? No, this is a hypomyces. I did the micro. Well, hypomyces is an, as, is an asco. Oh. I meant, oh yeah, you, yes, yes. It's not a cross, not a basidium micota. It's an asco micota. Mm. So I did the, the spores. Oh, they wow, are divided only, uh, only one septa. So I checked many, 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 and although the shapes are very varied, only one division. I won't get bigger. It won't get bigger because that's from the microscope. Mm, and... Here you can see other elements of the kifa with the spores. I mean, actually, it's conidio spores, yeah? For this um, hypomyces. <sighs> okay, that's, that's all. Do any of you communicate with Tom Vogue out in Wisconsin? Mm, I don't know him. Why well, done the later porous and used to tell us it was a uh, species complex of about seven different species. Oh, okay. So, uh, he used to, well, some of us who are older know him well. Mm. And he, a uh, particularly good speaker at the Northeast in Nama Forest. I haven't seen him for a couple of years. He was at Gary Linkoff's memorial service last time I saw him. Anyway, he likes to look at polypores and could probably tell you about the later porous. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Tom, Tom did a, um, a workshop at NJMA maybe five or six years ago on uh, uh, scoping polypores. Was that's been since I left. I know he did a workshop for the club in 2005 because I had him or 2004, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, this was He's a more recent than that. He has done something more recent for the club than that? I think probably about 2013 or 14, 15, maybe. I, I, but it was more recent than 2005. Okay. Yeah. He, teaches, he teaches it at that place in Maine. That's where I took his polypore class. Eagle Hill. <clears throat> Eagle Hill, yeah. Yeah, I saw him at Eagle Hill also, <laughs> one of his classes. So, but it's, I don't remember how many years ago it was. Hmm. We'll have to get him out here <laughs> again soon. Yeah, well, he's a good contact for questions on just about anything. 
his name? Can you write his Tom, name in the chat? Well, I don't know how to do the chat thing. It's Tom V O L K. And if you Google just Tom Volk Fungi dot net. Oh, Tom Volk. Yeah, he has a lot of I, I know his posts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know yeah, his posts. He used to maintain a really good web website. I don't know if he still does, but he, he I'm not, again, I'm not sure if he's still at the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Um, yeah, I think, I think he is. No, yeah. I think that he quit and he's doing something really completely different. No, no, no mushrooms. Oh, really? I saw it in Facebook. Yep. I think he's doing heavy metal. I can't remember what it is because it was something really weird and people were like, what? <laughs> he he does this marching band thing. Yeah, he's always say, done that. He's, he's a big fan of marching bands, so he may have become an advisor or something of that. I can't uh, recall, but yeah, people were like, what are you doing? And I, you can still find his post. I, many times I ended on his posts. Yeah. Yeah, he, he'll, he'll, he'll show up on Facebook and lay down the law when everyone's arguing and fighting about something. He shows up and just, <laughs> he usually puts an end to it. <laughs> yep. He's a fabulous speaker. All right, so Dave, you ready to go? Yeah, go ahead. I'm ready. And then Timur, you're next after that. Oh, yeah. All right, so here's your first one, Dave. Yeah, we found this on a local uh, foray with our little club here, Wyoming Valley Mushroom Club. First I saw it and I thought it was some kind of hygrosophy. Looked it over a little bit and said this, I don't know if any hygrosophy looks like this. Then I thought it was an entoloma. Entoloma's pretty close. It's entocybe. It's, um, it's got spores that are vaguely angular when viewed in profile. And I got a couple of pictures of the spores. It grows in pine needles. And I think this is Entocybe, uh, what is it? Uh, Punit, I, I haven't remembered the species name yet. Uh, uh, there it is, Pis Piscua. Piscua. And I got that name off, C to Q is Champignon du Quebec. And the description and pictures there seem to fit this better than the two different entocybe species that um, Tim Browney has in his field guide. So, um, and the spore size was uh, pretty close to what it was supposed to be. And uh, you can see here the spores, some of the ones in profile are vaguely angular. It's like they're not, see, they're not really smooth around, around the perimeter. It's uh, vaguely yeah. angular. And um, some of them you can see more so than others. Uh, when, when viewed from, from the top down, like a polar view, um, they, they, they look sort of subglobose. Um, but pretty, pretty cool genus. It's, um, I, at, at once, once upon a time, I think these were, these entocybes were put in uh, ro rhodocybe. I think it's rhodocybe. It's an, another split off of entoloma. There are no hymenial cystidia. I took a picture of this thing right here. I wasn't sure what it was, but apparently it's a basidiol or a basidium or a basidium, basidium. Um, because uh, one of the things about this genus is it produces mushrooms without hymenial cystidia. And you can see the pink spore print. So it's got a pink spore print, pretty, pretty much like Entoloma or a Clytopillus, which is also kind of related to Entoloma, I guess. Uh, so that was a pretty cool thing to find. Never, never identified anything from this genus before. So I was, I was happy to find that thing. There were just two of them there. Okay, I guess we can go to the next one. And what do we have here? Oh, I think this might be the thing that's gonna turn out to be, oh no, this 
was photographed by uh, somebody in our club. And then I went back. I wanted to see what kind of tree it was on. And, um, and this is a hemlock. And this was apparently started growing years back. And you can see the pore surfaces of these layers are pointed horizontal to the ground. And then there's a new growth that's pointed perpendicular to the ground. And that's because this thing apparently started growing on this hemlock. Um, and then the hemlock toppled over after this thing was growing on it for a few years. These are, these are perennial. And, and then it continued to grow, but oriented differently. And is what's what's that? Geotropism. That's called where it changes directions. Oh, okay. Perpendicular right, is when the tree was upright. Mm -hmm. The tree fell down. Mm -hmm. The fruiting body had to reorient so that the pores were facing down to to uh, release the spores. Right. Right. So these it's not typically the shape of what it would be. No. 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 It isn't. Um, it would be typically just like a stack of pancakes, sort of, you know. Um, uh, but I'm pretty sure this is Phomatopsis ocracia because that's been growing on the hemlocks. And also the, the red KOH reaction with uh, um, the flesh uh, suggests Phomatopsis. And this is definitely not Phomatopsis pinnacola or Phomatopsis mountiae. Um, so Phomatopsis ocracia is what makes sense to me. And I'm starting to wonder if this Phomatopsis ocracia might actually be a name that's applied to more, more than one um, taxon. Um, I did send some Phomatopsis ocracia that I picked off Hemlock um, to Stephen Russell. He told me he would sequence things that I sent him. Uh, I did that last spring. I don't know if he had that sequence, but uh, so that, that's what I think this is. And, and when you first put the KOH on the little, uh, when I first put it on the little piece, first it was like orange red, pretty, pretty bright, pretty, pretty vivid. This color of reddish here you see facing us is kind of the second stage. And then see on the lateral sides here, it's like really dark, it, it darkens. So this was actually two different, you know, applications of KOH or maybe three different. So, so it goes from like orange, to red, to, to very, very dark, and then eventually it becomes almost black. Um, but yeah, I think that's what that is. I, well, I put it on there as I call it that, because I, I can't think of any, any other po possibility for, for what this might be. So that was just kind of cool the, the way it was growing. Um, and the other cool thing is this species I never saw this until a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago. It showed up on all the hemlocks that were dying in, in Ricketts Glen. And now it's, it's like one of, the, one of the most common species that I see there. It is perennial though. So, you know, it sticks around for years. So you'll see it, then you'll see more, then you'll see more and the old ones are still there too. So, um, okay. I didn't, I didn't do any scoping of it. I'm really not sure how to get any place with something like that. But what do we have? What do I have next? I forget. Oh, this wow. is interesting. This trichomopsis. Um, this looks just like trichomopsis sulfuroides, I guess is how you, how you say it. And if you look at the picture of the fruit body, there's two of them. It's not very scaly on top. Maybe some very, 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 very small flat scales. If you, if you, if I look very closely, it's very, very yellow. So it doesn't look like decorum. It looks like sulfuroides. <coughs> but the spores are too big for sulfuroides. The spores fit in with Trichomopsis decorum. So I preserved it. Maybe I'll send it to Stephen or somebody, if somebody else is interested. But these spores are, they're, they're too long for, um, for trichomopsis sulfuroides, at least what's on record. Sometimes I wonder about these spore size ranges that you read in field guides. I wonder how many of those reports go back 50 years and have never been revised. And people just keep copying the same dimensions over and over and over for field guides. So 
I, I wonder about that sometimes. That is a good point. Mm -hmm. I so, think you're right about that. Yeah, so so this really looks like sulfuroalides. Um, okay, so. Yeah, I find that up here where I am on conifer logs. Yeah, it's up, both species tend to fruit on conifer. The sulfuroides and and decora. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, they're both they're both hemlock. They both hem like hemlock a whole lot, and probably other conifers as well. Um, yeah. Resupinate. Okay, so what's I forget what that is. Uh, let's see. This might be the thing that I. Um, oh, somebody proposed tricaptan board by form. Somebody <laughs> already came on here and said, "Oh, oh, well, guess who? Guess who it is." <laughs> I always, I always look at your polypores when you email me earlier in the day. <laughs> well, good. You know, I thought, okay, it's purple, you know, but I, to me, it just didn't look like what I'm used to calling tricaptum. I mean, these gigantic sort of resupinate things with these thick, pretty, fairly thick fleshed cap-like things protruding off. And, you know, it's just not what I'm used to thinking of tricaptum. So, well, thanks, Luke. Um, now I can go into my pictures and put a label on this. Okay. So if you, if you do a close-up on that last one, you can see the pores are kind of, actually, the last pic picture, the, the last one's a little bit better than this. I didn't get any great pictures. I guess you can sort of see the pore, the the walls are starting to elongate. Oh yeah, you can yeah, tell. yeah. They're starting to elongate. So I guess this is what tricaptum looks like when when the pore walls are first beginning to turn into these uh, tooth tooth like or spine like projections. So I guess I guess this is probably a pretty young specimen. You know, relatively speaking for tricaptum, you know, it might be two months old, but that's young for tricaptum. I'm not really sure. Okay, so we've got that one settled now. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, I finally got around to eating these and put on my life list. Um, not recommended for beginners. There's other uh, gray uh, trichilomas that, that will make you sick. Um, but I, I found a whole bunch of these. There were like at least 100 of them uh, in a little area under some white pines and um on, on a lawn and so i picked the nicest ones i could find took them home and um now you have to be careful eating trichuloma um there are cases um reported from europe poland and france where people died from eating too many trichulomas um trichuloma trichuloma equestre was the bad one this is trichuloma terium uh supposedly though that it is suspected that the same toxin that apparently has a very acute tipping point, like you can eat these trichulomas in moderation and nothing happens, you would never know that there's anything wrong with them. But it, but people who got sick ate trichuloma equestre, the man on horseback, trichuloma flavovirens is the other name, the yellow, yellow gilled trichuloma, canary mushroom, they also call it. Um, people died from eating them. They ate like, you know, a quarter to a half pound a day for like five days straight. Mm. Um, but I never, found, I, I don't find these terium in, in any kind of quantity. I'll find like two of them, you know, they, but yes. Somebody's asking if they, uh, they, they drank alcohol when they ate this. Uh, Un unknown, but I, but I drank alcohol and oh. I didn't die. So, um, <laughs> so here I am. Um, did, you, did you like them? Oh, they were great. Yes, they were very tasty. And and like with russulas, you you do a little field taste test, I guess, to make sure you don't have one of the uh, uh, bitter ones. Uh, yeah, they were really. I was surprised how good they were. Um, very tasty and nice texture. And I just fried them up with onions and salted and peppered them and had them as a side dish and they were really good. Um, so I finally got around to eating those. They, they pick a lot of these up in Canada. There's a website I help 
uh, do identifying on called um, wildmushroomhunting.org. And there's a lot of Canadians post on there. And they, they, they seem to pick a lot of these up there and in Michigan also. Dave, somebody has yeah. a question for you. Oh, okay. Yes, go ahead. On the chat. Oh, um, on the chat. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, how many times have I repeated this experiment on myself? I do not eat them on, I, ate, I don't eat them on any more than two consecutive days and I won't eat more than just a, an ounce or two. So I, I, I really, uh, what's the allergy? They don't know, undetermined. There's been studies. Somebody said they isolated the toxin in trichilomas. They found it also in portentosum and enterium. And then another study came out and said that one was wrong. <laughs> so there's, it's still kind of an unknown thing. Um, Triculum equestre, which was the culprit in the Polish and, and uh, French incidents, has been eaten for hundreds of years in a variety of different cultures worldwide. And it's considered to be a choice edible. So this was a big surprise when these incidents occurred. And there's been various things have been hypothesized. Um, toxic environment, um, just a tip. I, to me, the thing that makes the most sense is there's just a very acute tipping point. And, and, and the toxin does not accumulate, but it will stay in your body for a few days, apparently. Because in, in the cases where people got sick, they were eating these every day for like five days. And there's also another... Someone has, someone has suggested that they may have been undercooked or maybe not cooked at all. Um, so is there a common name for this? Um, gray knight, there's like a bunch of different gray knights. Um, those are the gray trichilomas. Um, some of them are bitter. Some of them apparently will just make you have an upset stomach and, and be sick. Um, yeah, there are several trichiloma Portentosum is another one that's eaten pretty widely. And terium is considered to be a species complex. Um, the ones I found here, I took some close up pictures of buttons to show that there actually was an ephemeral uh, partial veil on, on these. Um, so some of the pictures I have here actually shows a tiny, tiny little bit of string, stringy stuff connecting the, um, um, the so, so a subsequent picture here, I guess a little further down. I've got some photos of really tiny buttons. Um, like this one right here. See where it, see there, there's a little tiny bit of, um, right there. Yeah, where, yeah, okay. see if there's a little bit of, of veil there that's remaining. And you can also see on the cap margin, there's a bunch of stringy stuff. And, and that's probably uh, the result of, of the partial veil. So some, some mycologists consider the ones that have partial veil, they call it triculum and myomyces. Um, but there's been, uh, my understanding is that um, more mycologists are now tending to lump together terium and myomyces. And, uh, and it's, it's hard to find these in this young enough stage where you even see any evidence of partial fail. So that might go unnoticed quite often. Okay, so that's that one. White, white spored mushroom, of course, like all trichulomas. Oh, so these late season Amanita muscaria, I was driving home from work and there's a lawn near a high school um, down in the Wyoming Valley in Nanticoke. And uh, there were mushrooms under the under the white pines, young, fairly young white pines. So I figured, oh, let's see what they are. I figured they were probably Amanita muscaria. There were other mushrooms there too, though. There were Lacaria, there was um, an agaragus that was kind of old. So the interesting thing about these particular muscaria variety, Gisoia, look how white they look. So this is a species that has sometimes been confused with this sort of mythical species uh, I think it's Amanita trisoblemus or something, C-H-R-Y, blah, 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 something, uh, the, which is considered to be the white North American muscaria. And this picture right here, 
you see what looks like a tiny cap and a big cap? Those are halves of the exact same cap. The tiny part, I, I pulled off the stem and laid it down on my spore collection board on a slide to try to get some spores. The bigger half was as small as the smaller half, but I didn't pull the stem off and I just laid it down on a table. And amanitas will continue to grow if you just put them on a table. And this one continued to grow even though it was cut in half. Oh my God. So that's the same mushroom, two halves of the same mushroom. That's well known. To, if you have an Amanita button and you want to see what the spores are, you can put it in a damp paper towel in the bottom of a plastic cup and maybe cover the top with, you know, uh, something so you can watch it grow. Yeah. Full size. Yeah, it's quite interesting to do. I haven't done it for a long time, but we used to do that years ago all the time. Yeah, I've, I've had plenty of Amanitas do that where I bring them home and put them on a table and they do that. But this one was cut in half. <laughs> and the half that the one half that was left on the stem That's continued pretty. to grow and the other half that was the stem was pulled off did not expand and i got spores out of both halves Jeez. once once i saw that expanded ha half i put that on a slide and i think these spores are probably from that so <laughs> i didn't check to see how well these spores match muscaria gasoii but i'm but i'm guessing they do. And there's one more picture you can see back there. So you might say, well, how do I know those white ones are not this mythical trisoblemus thing? Well, the picture below the one that we saw before, so down here, yeah, that one, right? There's one of them is cut. One of them is cut. One of them is sectioned. Now, if you look very carefully, you might want to do a zoom here, Luke. Um, if you look very carefully on the apex of the, of the cap, you can see the little bit of pigment that's underneath the universal veil. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is not a white amanita. Mm -hmm. This is an amanita that's, that's got a, a lot of universal veil left on it. And apparently these late season muscaria gasoei that, that, uh, that grow around here have um, very thick universal veils. And maybe that's just a function of growing when it's cold. You know, it's it's like some mushrooms have like really a lot of slime on them, a lot of the late season mushrooms, and that's sort of insulation from the cold. And maybe that's how maybe that's how this really thick universal veil is is uh, mm. helping this mushroom here. But you can see that the yellow, orange yellow pigment underneath. Rod Tulas told me to do this. He said, he told me, he said, he's got so many white, so supposedly white amanitas from people and he sections them and you can see the pigment. So it's not really a white amanita. It's, it's a, it's a muscaria gasoei. So, so hey, question. Yes. Has anybody tried to catch flies with amanita muscaria? I have read about some people doing that and that mixed results. One per, because one, in France, this is the way they used to do it in France. Yeah. When the amanita is old, it becomes concave. You put a little bit of milk in it. Yeah. It attracts the flies and the fly die. That's what I've heard. And, you know, uh, there was a discussion on, might have been on Mushroom Observer, maybe about four years ago. Uh, some people were trying that out. I think one person said he couldn't get any flies to come. And another person said that indeed some flies started to show up, but maybe it wasn't until the, the mushroom got old. I forget the exact um, content of that discussion, but I have not. But you do that it. indoors. You do that indoors, not you outdoors. You do that indoors. I know, I know, I know. That's, that's In a place where you already have flies. Right, I see. Right. They, I have not tried it, though. Dave, I remember that we have a... Uh, uh, discussion about that and in, in one foray somebody uh, posted a photo of uh, manitas with flies on it uh -huh. and then later when they came back to the little tray where the manitas were the flies were gone and they said that the manitas were having like a trick they were like knocked down they didn't really die they were like knocked down by some effect of them. They were having oh, a Oh, they were stupefied. Yes. I have uh -huh. read 
I have and, read that flies become stupefied. Yeah, and, yeah, then, and then they're easier they to disappear. kill. <laughs> I once ran across a great big Amanita muscaria in a field. There was, I'm sure there was some birch tree or something there that had been nibbled quite extensively. And about 50 yards away from the nibbled Amanita was a groundhog behaving very strangely. Now, maybe the groundhog had rabies, I don't know. Um, but the groundhog was behaving very, it was not running away from me, it was just rolling around. And um, um, so I think, I think if you put two and two together there, I suppose, you know, the, um, the groundhog was, was pretending to be a shaman, you know, and, um, <laughs> and he was going to lead the other groundhogs into some sort of uh, mythical um, 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 uh, vision or something. But anyway, um, that's, that I did see that once. <laughs> um, I have only one more here. Um, and it's one that John and Nina have helped me with, because I used to just always throw these in, these like these like um, orangish lactaria that have fleshy colored gills and they're not okra purpurea and they grow usually under pine or or other or or hardwood sometimes. I would just throw them all into the lactaria lactata pot, you know, like okay, they're all just that. But then I started looking at spores, and sometimes the spores were globose, subglobose, like Lacaria lacata is supposed to be. And sometimes the spores were more broadly ellipsoid, and maybe even a few verging on ellipsoid, and like these, right? And so, so John and Nina told me, oh, well, that's, that's Lacaria proxima. So, you know, so I looked it up, and you know what? It, it really seems to fit that, that, that label seems to fit and these don't look all that different than Lakata. I mean these are kind of distinctive looking because they have this patterned cap but I think that was just a function of weather um, but not a bad shot of the gills there and the stems um, that's a good photo actually yeah, yeah that, that one came out pretty nicely but mm -hmm. those photos came out sometimes I get I point and shoot you know and and I try a few different automatic settings, and sometimes I get lucky. And it's just a matter of having the right lighting conditions, really. You got a fly there. <laughs> no. Yeah, look at the little fly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't notice that. Yep. All right, that's all I have. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. All right, uh, Tamor, want to go? Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. I have uh, uh, four mushrooms I'd like to show you guys. Uh, so I took some photographs at, um, at the Blewett patch that I discovered um, a few weeks ago. And uh, these photographs were taken on my second trip to the Blewett patch. Now, um, I wasn't as a careful in documenting uh, my finds. So I, in most cases, I went only as far as just to photograph from the different angles, uh, the fruiting bodies. I did not do the spore prints uh, nor sectioning. So, um, so here's my first mushroom that I have here. Let's see. Uh, can you guys see the mushrooms here? We can see your thumbnails, yes. Okay. Do you see the enlarged photograph? Negative. Too little. Sorry? It's too little. Too little? Okay. How about now? Nope. Not yet. Anything? Coming. It's trying. Mm. No. Mm, OK. 
Okay, let me try something else. About now? No, we're just getting a uh, blank window when you do that. Lots of neat things behind it. <laughs> How about now? Nothing. It says here your screen sharing is paused. I wonder how I, I would unpause that. Okay, give me just a moment here. You gotta figure this out. Uh, how about now? Yep. There we go. Okay, excellent. So, <laughs> seems like the way this works is uh, the program wants you to select an application to display instead of a computer screen. And I have two computer screens attached to the computer here. All right, uh, so this is the first mushroom. Um, the general context is that uh, the area is deciduous uh, and uh, nearly 100% oak. Uh, and uh, all four mushrooms were found in the area of uh, you know, fallen trees. And that is being the first one. Oops. They're on, on the ground though, right? Uh, we, yeah, that Clytosophy clavipes is how I learned that mushroom. Yeah, now it's Ampulo Clytosophy Yeah, fancy for me to learn. <laughs> <laughs> What's the species? Uh, so so the, uh, the scale here, uh, the transparent plastic is a little over three inches. Yeah, that sounds right. What's the species name? My um, favorite is Clytosophy clavipes. Clavipes. It has a very big fat foot that something yep. is just waterlogged. You could squeeze the water. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they, they absorb a lot of water and they have the decurrent white gills and white spore print. Right. There's another one that's um, Clytosophy subclavipes, but that one supposedly has darker gills. I've never found it, or at least I've never ID'd it. But this is clavipes, I'd say. Usually I find this on their pine, but it's, it's, it's not picky. We used to find it in New Jersey just about everywhere. Yeah, it's not picky. Up yep. here, I find it with pine. Yeah, yep. I find it with pine here. That's a good picture of the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, Supposedly, this mushroom will cause very unpleasant symptoms if consumed with alcohol. <laughs> uh, what did you say the common name was? Uh, Clubfoot clitosophy or thickfoot clitosophy. Depends on what book you're looking in. <laughs> yeah. Common names are not as common as one might think. <laughs> Some of them are, but not. Yeah. Some well, you know, around here, um, people call bullets spongies. That's an old timer name. Uh, you'll often hear like an old, older mushroom hunter around here will say, oh, it's some kind of spongy, you know, which narrows it down to a few hundred species. But in Southeast PA, spongies are morels. Ooh. In southern Luzerne County, red tops or red caps are lexinum. In northern Luzerne County, red tops or red caps are russulas. <laughs> yeah, I, oh. common names can be misleading. Hmm. Okay, so that's that guy. It, it's interesting that you mentioned alcohol because this and some of the caprinus have basically have ant abuse, which is a drug that you offer to alcoholics to discourage them from consuming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if this 
uh, Hatasibi has that. Uh, but there, there are reports um, of, of this happening. Sometimes you have to wonder about reports about people getting sick too. I mean, did they just eat too much of something? Did they eat mushrooms that were spoiled? Did they drink too much alcohol? It's, it's really, sometimes you do have to wonder. But there are reports. Um, I, see, I, so I'm not going to eat this mushroom because <laughs> I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to like give up drinking for five days and then give up drinking again for five days, you know, just to eat some mushrooms. Um, so any, anyway, there are reports. You, you, you'll find them if you look around. All right. Uh, so the second mushroom, I guess I'll have to share the screen again. Let's see. Okay. So again, the uh, clear plexiglass is a little over three inches. So it looks like the largest diameter here uh, maybe is uh, an inch and a half. I, did, I only took two photographs, so I cannot tell you if the underside is a gill or a different kind of a configuration. Uh, I did not section it. I didn't do a spore print. So it's very little information to go on with, but I feel like just judging by the coloration here, it might be a brick top or a brick cap. Although I know that there is a, um, I believe there's a poison variant or, or a po poisonous lookalike to, um, to the brick cap. Yeah, Hypholoma fasciculare is the poisonous one that's got yellow or green gills. There's also Hypholoma subviride. That's a, more of a southern um, uh, North American species. But I think, honestly, my guess about this would be, because it's growing on the ground in leaf litter, I think this might be Rhodocolibia bunny racia. You'd have to see the gills, though. What is the common name to this one? Buttercap. Oh, buttercap. Okay. Right. That's just a guess, though. We really need more information. Yeah, that's right. It's just yeah. I'll do a much better job next time in documenting these mushrooms. Yeah, just turn just turn it over and get a picture of the underside. You get a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah, the thing is, I was so focused on collecting uh, the bluets for the table that I just didn't have the time. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Eight hours in, in, in taking <laughs> pictures of everything I came across. I had to cut some corners. Yeah, well, when there's a bunch of really good edibles out there, it's kind of hard to get excited, you know, about some LBMs or something, you know. So. Exactly, yeah. yeah. For some of you who have not photographed mushrooms much before, if you have a bunch of mushrooms, especially if there's more than one, just turn one over in the same photograph, pick it completely down to the bottom of the stem so that that can be seen also. And then some of us will split one in half and put it in the same picture if you have enough of the mushrooms to do that. Mm -hmm. But at least then you don't have to take multiple photos if you get one good shot of all of the features. Yeah. My, my concern also was that uh, since I had only one a usable knife for harvesting uh, the bluet, I didn't want to sacrifice that knife cutting into uh, suspicious looking uh, mushrooms, thinking that perhaps if they're poisonous, then I will contaminate my bluet, which I consume. I don't think it would be enough contamination. And also, if you're, if you're picking it for looking at it, you don't even need the knife. You just need to get your fingers all the way down to the bottom. Yep. Another thing I could have done, I could have just, um, I guess, taken it home and uh, sectioned it off at home in the kitchen. But, okay. So all right. You have more to more? Oh, yeah. yeah. Or or if not Rhodocolibia, maybe um, maybe Gymnopus, something like Gymnopus drophilus or close. There's a few other species that are similar, but you need to see the bot. You need to see the underside. Okay. All right. So here's the next one. Let's see. So uh, how do I describe this one? So this mushroom um, grew in a very small patch. Uh, the patch included several individuals. Um, I mostly photographed the most mature individual uh, because it stood out like a sore thumb. It has a very large diameter cap. Uh, and um, speaking of um, photography, 
it seemed to occupy a lower elevation than my blue attach. And also it seemed as if it preferred to, it, it preferred to be in, in a kind of a, a wash area or downstream from uh, the blue patch and the other mushrooms I previously showed you guys. Um, upon uh, kind of feeling the stem, and I have a few, few other photographs I'll uh, go through, but upon feeling the stem, it uh, felt um, very fibrous, very tough, almost I would say woody. Um, so again here, um, for the scale, uh, the length of my compass might be like uh, a little under six inches. It's a pretty tall mushroom compared to everything else so far that I've shown you. There's a, here's a close-up of that stem. Looks like it's a honey of some sort. Yeah, yeah. it's an armillaria. Yeah. And uh, here's, here's the connection between the cap and, and uh, the stem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the ring and the surface of the stem is what's besides the white gills is what's telling us it's probably a honey armillaria species. What, what is the common name? Honey mushroom is it? Honey, honey mushroom. Honey mm -hmm. color for the cap, which do you have a picture of the cap straight on? Absolutely, yeah. But first I'd like to ask you about um, what is that knot over there? Is that a partial veil or something else? You mean the the material on the on the, the ring? Just above your finger? Yeah, exactly. that's remnants of a veil or tissue that was attached from the stem to the edge of the cap before the mushroom opened out all the way, protecting the gills while they were maturing. Okay, so it's a remnant of the egg it used to be in? No. Partial what, veil. No, it's not a universal uh, veil. Oh, okay. Universal would have covered the entire mushroom. This is just the ring annulus. What's another word, Dave? Um, ringed annulus. That's pretty much the two words that are used. I mean, sometimes you'll see things like ring zone, but this is a, a persistent ring. Yeah, and also it's kind of cotton woolly in the armillaria that I'm familiar with. Yeah, there's the, the different species of armillaria have like different, form different kind of rings, like um, malia forms a fairly membranous ring. Uh, Gallica, a lot of times the the partial veil will collapse and, and it'll be an indistinct ring or maybe a zone. Um, solidipes forms a fairly distinct ring. This, yeah, one's really, this is probably malia. It's not showing as very scaly, but then it may have been kind of beaten by rain or the sun. Yeah, ma malia is the one that has the least scaly cap. Yeah, so the diameter here is like three inches. Yeah, Melee gets gets big too. Melee can get pretty big. What mm -hmm. when was this found? How long ago? Uh, this was found at the end of um, October, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's... Is it growing on dead wood? What's that? Is it growing on dead wood? No, it grew directly on the ground and was surrounded by tree litter and maybe in a kind of a wash area. Uh, downstream of uh, of the blue patch and the other so probably some buried wood where it was growing maybe old roots or something hmm. oh uh, maybe uh, armillaria grows direct directly on wood and also grows seemingly terrestrially um but if it's growing seems to be growing on the ground it's probably growing from buried wood yeah this looks like some kind of armillaria it's a very aggressive pathogen on the roots of trees. So up here I see it sometimes as clusters and clumps on the on the bottom of trees where the trunk goes into the ground, or I'll find them singly all over the woods, but they're they're attached to and trying to kill whatever the trees around it are. Ooh, that's so. hmm. And that's a it's it's a it's a species complex of about eight species. Again, you guys need to connect with Tom Voke. He did his Thesis, I think his doctorate thesis or his master's on Armillaria melia, and I think he he uh, said there was something like eight species in the complex in North America. I, I think he expanded that number eventually. Oh, I haven't. In, yeah, I haven't. In the teens, I believe. <laughs> oh gosh, I can believe that. 
Yeah, well, there's some other ones that grow on the Western North America that are really all quite a bit different than, than ours. What you're showing on the cap surface there looks more typically of a, a, of a honey mushroom. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. more scales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, today somebody sent me an, a picture of an armillaria from Germany, just today. Mm -hmm. oh. I, you know, if we have time, I can show you it. I can show it to you the picture. What is the um, what is the edibility status of this uh, honey mushroom? It's considered choice, but you yeah, have when they're when they're young, they're no. good. I don't like them because they're a little bit slimy. Oh, I didn't get the feeling that this adult sample here was slimy at all. I felt actually no. When you cook fact, it, when you cook it, it's slimy. Okay. All all of the people in my area like Luzerne County and the surrounding counties in Northeast PA. Uh, this is one of the, their favorite mushrooms, but mostly when they're young, mostly when they're just starting to expand and the partial veil is uh, still covering the gills. Uh, when they're really expanded like this, they're not as good. Mm -hmm. But everyone around here parboils them, including me. Mm -hmm. And there are reports of people becoming ill, pretty badly ill, like sick for two or three days, like they have the flu after eating or malaria. And I know three people have told me stories of being sick, one of whom was Tim Gehoe, who used to be the uh, president of the Washington DC club. He lives, he now lives in South Carolina. He told me he ate or malaria and was sick for three days, really sick. And I asked him if he parboiled them. He said, no. And the other two people who I know who got sick from our malaria did not parboil them. And the books will tell you our malaria needs to be well cooked. So the nice thing is when they are parboiled, they really don't lose much, um, much of the quality. Um, as Susan said, though, you have to sort of get past the sliminess. There's a couple of ways you can get past the sliminess. You can saute them for an extended period of time, part, part, part of the time with the, the skillet covered and um, you know, scrape them around and stir them around. Um, and that kind of reduces the slime. Or you can put them in, in just meals where you don't notice the slime, like beef stroganoff or uh, spaghetti sauce or some other sort of stew. Uh, they're very popular here. They call them popinkis yes. uh, around here. Um, that's a, a perversion of a Polish word um, because there's a lot of Polish immigrants around here. Very, very popular mushroom. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would recommend young ones and parboil them. And when you, after you parboil them, they freeze really well. Um, don't dry them off. Let them stay really wet. Pack them tightly in, in plastic wrap and then cover that with foil or something and they, they freeze pretty well. They don't, lose much, they don't lose much quality. Okay, I'm sorry, we got a new one here now. Yeah, okay, just another minute, okay, two more. Yeah, this is, this is the last one and I have just two photographs. Again, not very descriptive, but we can see that uh, the thing has gills. Uh, the foot is kind of wide and uh, the gills are attached to, to the stem. I don't have a top-down view of the cap, unfortunately just kind of like this other yeah. photograph. It looks like it would be a brick top. Uh, yeah. And, and, and they're, they're, kind of, they're kind of perched in a nook. Um, like a yeah, wood, out wood. wood. Yeah, like basically inside of a wooden area. Yeah, yeah now if it's... Hypholomas. Do you know if it's hardwood or conifer? Uh, let's assume it's oak because it is an oak grove here. Yeah, it looks like it might be. Looks like oak, yeah. Yeah, that would favor a brick cap, a lateridium, hypholoma lateridium. How do you tell the difference between capnoides and the other species? Mostly capnoides grows on conifer wood. It's also a little more yellow than than um, uh, brick red, but but the, these these traits are apparently not constant. I have heard that lateridium has been found on conifer, and I have seen what I believe is capnoides with um, caps that have uh, some sort of an orange hue to them. So that's a good question. How do you tell for sure? 
when they're really vividly brick red sort of caps and they're on hardwood, I'd say you've got a pretty good chance you're, you're, you know, you've got ladder idiom. All right, well, thanks to Mark. So, so that's it for my mushrooms. Uh, thank you very much for your advice and your identification. You're welcome. All right, and I'm going to take just a minute and share my screen. I found this tricholoma in Philadelphia, which I was pretty happy about because I don't really see very many tricholomas here in Philadelphia. Kind of an uncommon thing, but there's this was uh, around uh, some hemlock. We just don't have a lot of conifer here in Philadelphia. Um, but this is around some hemlock. So I was calling it tricholoma sejuntum. Luke, I think, yes. I, think uh, I think our North America sejuntum is sub sejuntum. Oh, yeah? Thanks, Yeah, usually sub sejuntum, which I, I agree with John. I think that's the consensus is that's the, that's the North American species. Usually has some yellow on the gills, and it's usually got some green on the cap. Um, so I don't, but I have no alternative proposal for this. Um, that's an interesting one. Yeah, it was under hemlock. Um, you know, it was the gills were mostly whitish. There was a slight yellowing to them. Mm -hmm. There was a slight yellowing in there, and the cap was also kind of it was really really dirty like pasted like i had to actually had to wash it off to see it <laughs> yeah a lot of trichilomas are like that yeah um, ter was terium of... is not really like that but a lot of the other trichilomas because they when they fruit they're sticky mm -hmm. if you go on mushroom observer i've got a lot of trichilomas subsejunctum posted because i it's pretty common around here right. and it does grow under hemlock and pine mixed woods all kind of woods really but usually some conifers mixed in. Yeah, that, this is what it looked like when I pulled it up out of the ground. <laughs> oh <it>. boy. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, there was only one of them. And like I said, I don't find very many um, trichilomas at all around here. So it was worth bringing home. All right, so sejunctum is what I call, you guys are saying sub sejunctum, if it were to be that. Yeah, I, you know what? I'll look in, I have the trichilom, do you have the trichiloma book? Yeah, I was using that. Mm -hmm. John Plisky uh, agreed with that, but I don't know if he looks at him really that closely, to be honest with you. Sometimes. Well, it could be. I mean, I just might be used to um, seeing more yellow and green, and, and maybe that's not, those traits are not constant in, in the species. Yeah, you know, one of the things I was looking at on here, too, was these black fibrils. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The black fibrils, I think, is, is is distinctive for that. Yeah, that's one of the traits of of sub subjunctum. That that's that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a maybe. Did you taste it? Did I taste it? I feel like I. I don't recall I, if I did. I definitely. Yeah, I forget it. what it's supposed to taste like, actually. But a lot of times with trichilomas, you'll get some information from okay. what they taste like. Then I found this other thing. I call it a quaternarius. I'm not really hopeful that anybody will really be able to tell anything because there was only one of them and they were really young. Yeah. But look at this thing. Look how slimy this thing is. I called it a quaternarius uh, in the, what is that, mixasium group? Yeah, I think mixasium is the, is the subgenus where the whole thing is slimy. Yeah. Yes. Cap and stem. The only other thing it could have been it was like a limoncella, right? But limoncella. 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 Well, or I don't think these are hygrophorous, but there are slimy hygrophorous that come up late in the season. Okay. But, yeah, but it yeah. just doesn't really look like hygrophorous. With this thick, thick, it's not like slime all over. It's it's definitely the whatever the slimy quaternary is. It, it's been too many years, but uh -huh. Jeff used to go round and round my ex-husband with this group. Meinhart Moser, do you have that book? Any no, I do not. Oh, the, the European Quaternarius book. Yeah, but it was it was uh, yeah it was a um, translated 
by Roger Phillips. Uh, uh, I've got really I've got a thing online that I or on my on my um, in my files that John Plischke gave me, and I think that's what it is actually, or or maybe some something lifted from that. Meinhart Moser studied the Quaternaries quite a lot, and even though it's an old book, it might be helpful. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the names of the Quaternaries haven't changed very much because nobody really wants to try to study them. There's like too to many of them. Yeah, it's like yeah, they're too hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, the only other thing I had, um, we'll end on this. This fella, just out of the, you guys might remember him, a guy named um, Jim Achi. Yes, I he do. Gave a, he gave a talk on the, Lyme disease. Yeah, on Lyme disease. <laughs> He said he's finally getting, he's finally getting his PhD at the age of sixty two on wow. ticks. <laughs> yeah, he, he sent um, a pretty cool photograph. He just thought he would share this photograph with us oh, wow. with a stink horn that actually is being consumed by flies. So he actually was sending us a note saying because he's been receiving our newsletter ever since he gave the uh, talk back yeah. in the nineties. And he said he loves the newsletter. So I hope we still do that. The newsletter? Yeah, and no, send it to what we used to call VIPs on our list. Yes, we do. There's a VIP list, and they get it's. I think it's mostly like editors and stuff from other clubs, but apparently, oh. apparently, he's still receiving it. He yeah, said he years, been, years ago it used to be sort of whoever Bob Peabody and a couple of us thought should get it. No. Botanic Gardens was probably one. Tom Vogue might have been one for a few years. Okay. People well, this guy, I guess, got on the VIP list and is still receiving it and said he loves the newsletter and sent this photograph as a token. So, anyway, that's about it. So, you have a species on this? Oh, I don't know. Who knows? I, 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 never, I can never remember these guys. Because I showed one about several months ago and we came up with the same idea that it they're really not very easily assigned to species. Yeah, this one doesn't have a lot of detail in it, to be honest with you, does it? Okay. You, you can kind of see that it's got the white tip on it back here. Hmm. Uh, uh, oh gosh, Mutinus caninus, Mutinus elegans, somebody else. It looks like it's going to have the branches, like one of the things they sometimes call stinky squid. Yeah, the pseudocola or whatever it used to be called. I forget the species name for those. I don't find them very often, once in a while. But it looks like it's going to have those, like, you know, arms branching out. Right. Or it's one that's just been wilted that's close. I that's what that. I thought. I oh, thought it might be it. more than one fruit body. Oh, fruit bodies, yeah. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, it's hard to tell. I don't think yeah. this is a branch one. I found that on mulch, and this looks really like just a stink horn. Mm -hmm. And the other two are just wilted beside it. Yeah, yeah it's, that that's that's probably what's going on there, because those stinky squid things, they don't have like any wrecked sort of. Uh, right. fruit body like that you know they just all spread out um, so that's probably what's going on there it's probably a few different ones and some of them are just kind of wilted yeah that makes sense it looks like it looks like the flies are just uh finishing off the black sticky stuff that used to be at the top of that yeah and the others they're completely done for yep yeah yeah i think that's what's going on too so i just thought it was a cool photograph it is very cool the uh, flies eating the gup, spreading the spores around. So, so, all right. Well, anyway, that brings us up to a little past nine. So that's about it for tonight. Thank you everyone for attending. Just a reminder that next week we are not going to be, um, we won't have the uh, taxonomy Tuesday because of the holiday. So I will be busy cooking away on Tuesday night for Thanksgiving. Um, so, but we will reconvene. Can we all on... come? <laughs> I'm sorry? Can we all come? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, well, I mean, yeah, sure. I can send you the menu. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we will reconvene on December 1st. That's in two weeks from now. So um, I wish everybody a good holiday. Stay safe and um, see you guys soon. All right. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Luke. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Happy holidays.